Farm for Profit Podcast. Take a listen, have a blast. Farm for Profit Podcast. Learn about farming while having a laugh. Farm for Profit Podcast. All right, here we are. Husker Harvest Days in front of a packed house. Gonna have a great standing, conversation. Standing room only in here. Standing room only. That's because there's no chairs. Yeah. Uh-huh. Good job, Corey. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's great. No, we're here to have a conversation around uh, a topic that we're getting more and more familiar with, and that is subsurface irrigation. Did I say that correctly, gentlemen? Subsurface drip irrigation. Drip irrigation. So we've got two guests here. We're gonna have a full podcast. All three of us are hanging out to have a great conversation with Jim and Kurt with a K. <laughs> just so everybody is clear. So no, uh, that, that'd be Jim Ed. Jim Ed. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. We do all this practice. See? Uh, but no, thank you so much for sitting in here. But let's start off with some introductions. Kurt with a K, why don't you start? Let us know who you are, where you're from, and uh, what your tie to the topic today is. Sure. So Kurt Grimm, home for me is northeast Kansas in Hiawatha. Uh, farm there on a family farm. Uh, got into drip irrigation on our own farm about 10 years ago, and we're a Netafim dealer servicing the Midwest. So we service, install, design, maintain drip irrigation systems. Nice. And Jim Ed, you as well. So Jim Ed Beach, I'm with Netafim USA. I serve as the U.S. commercial lead for sustainable solutions. Uh, I spent a, the last seven years uh, being a territory rep across the Midwest and Northern Plains and uh, moved into this role in February and I concentrated on our solution uh, around uh, separating solids out of manure and um, and then subsequently applying that uh, the the water through drip irrigation with uh, beef, swine, and dairy CAFO operations. Okay. So we are in the middle of irrigation country, I would say, correct? Is this the heartland of... Irrigation. This is the Mecca. The Mecca. So this is the irrigation show. Husker Harvest Days. The largest outdoor irrigation show. What did they try telling us? The west side of uh, (laughs) Grand Island, I think, (laughs) is what they said. (laughs) It's uh, something we are not familiar with from Iowa all that much, although we're getting better. And so we're going to also talk to some people that do some pivot irrigation and that kind of stuff. But this is this is even beyond the flood irrigation and the pivot irrigation. What what is drip irrigation so drip irrigation is in and specifically subsurface drip irrigation which is what we do is burying a drip line in the ground 12 to 16 inches deep every 40 or 60 inches um, in the field and watering and fertilizing from the bottom up so picture a buried line every 40 or 60 inches in the field it's got little emitters in it put out a specific amount of water um, and so we're irrigating at the root zone. And every 40 to 60. So you're not going like every 30 inches on a row. Right. You're going in between them or we, splitting them. Sometimes we will go 30, but typically 40 to 60 is the, the, the optimal ROI. And I've seen these little, it's like a, almost like it's a little black, like flat tape. And then these, like you said, it's got emitters. And those are like, are they anti-siphon? Is that? There's different kinds of emitters for different applications. So the anti-siphon pressure compensated is when we get into rolling terrain, like uh. what we would use in Iowa. Like on Kelly Garrett's ground, those mm-hmm. are definitely anti-siphon pressure compensated. Okay, so I, I don't follow, so we'll probably have listeners that aren't going to follow either. What What's anti-siphon, and how's that different than non-anti-siphon? So there are, there are two different types of drippers. So there's pressure compensating drippers, and then there are non-pressure compensating drippers. Non-pressure compensating drippers, as you increase the pressure, then they're going to apply more water through that dripper as you decrease and less and mm-hmm. so on. So when you have rolling terrain, um, it can call for a um, pressure compensating dripper. And so what happens with that is there is a, um, a membrane, it's a three piece emitter, and there's a membrane that goes up onto the bottom of that dripper. And then it only allows the specific amount of, wa- of water and or nutrients to go through that dripper that, um, that it's engineered for okay so um and then the anti-siphon component of it is um so when as that system shuts off then it does not uh suck back um uh siphon back into the dripper um soil particles like a tile uh, for for material right yeah so we kind of skipped over 
a lot of stuff. We've got to start kind of elementary, because I'm sure there's a lot of people like us and our, that are listeners that don't know what irrigation is, but this could potentially be a, a, a deal for them. Why drip irrigation over, you know, we see these pivots or the flood irrigation? Is it, is it a cost? Is it uh, efficiency? Wh- why? So I would say it's uh, a couple things, and, and Kurt, you can add on to this, but, um, you know, first and foremost, it's the most efficient type of irrigation in the world. So do you think, do you mean efficient for the plant or do you mean efficient for my pocketbook? It, it, most efficient use of water. Okay. So, Very good. So, um, so it gives you uh, the flexibility to place a lot less water um, in a specific place. It's more precision based, if, it, if you will. And um, so that's probably the first and foremost thing. And, and Kurt, you can add on. Uh, yeah, I think the, the reason growers choose drip um, cover all the acres, right? Center pivots typically are covering, you know, 60 to 70 percent of a field. That leaves out a good chunk of it. Um, the additional benefit you get from being able to inject nutrients at the root zone level, specifically phosphorus and potassium, very difficult to move through the soil. They mm-hmm. tie up to the clay particles, so it's you, it's almost impossible to do that with a center pivot unless your CECs are like five. Yeah. You just can't do it. And so when those nutrients become limiting, that's when drip really really has an advantage is we can get those immobile nutrients right into the roots. Right. So you were talking, getting get the most amount of water efficiently to the right spot. And so uh, assuming that that's right at the roots, you had me wondering when you said 12 to how deep was it? 16 inches. 16. So we're probably not doing any kind of deep tillage on any of these fields. Are, are we, is the goal to plant my corn directly over or directly by the side of your drip irrigation? So if we're 60 inch spacing, we're going to go in between every other row. You're going to go in between. Yep. And then the 40 inch spacing, the water on most soil types, that water will move laterally and cover the whole area. So if a guy's growing alfalfa, wheat, and he wants to water the whole thing, 40 inch is going to cover everything without having to pay attention to row orientation. That was going to be my question is what types of crops can be grown above this subsurface irrigation? Yeah, corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, cotton, depends on where you're at in the country. Yeah, I think probably over 200 crops you know the you know drip when it came to the u.s uh, so so our company invented drip back in israel in 1965 and then brought it to the u.s in in the 80s and the first crops that it was used on um you know at that time were really high value crops and the tree crops and stuff out out west on the west coast and so now the the um the market has really evolved to now include the midwest and central plains and and um the high plains and Corey, that's where you got introduced to it is your high value crop well it's low value now but yes it, it, <laughs> i did get in the aroni berries i i have it uh i had it every 14 foot by my aroni berry rose and i only ran it a few times because it turns out i really didn't need it all that much for the young plants that i had but i imagine it's a huge deal in the specialties like uh down like yuma arizona um we have our friend john dinsmore down there doing yeah. strawberries and tomatoes and peppers and all that kind of stuff it's made me wonder tanner you're asking about crops is there a certain soil type it works better in because when i think of nebraska here we might be a little bit more sandier soil lighter lighter soil but if we get to like uh, ohio and we're hard clay uh type soils it, does it work in all soil types it does. You manage them differently. And I would say that the two soil types that the payback is the quickest on are the two extremes, the sands and the clays, because those are the ones that either don't hold enough water or they don't give the water up quick enough. And so that's where we see the biggest benefit is in the sand and the clay. Definitely works in all of them, but you manage it differently. Is there a big push um, environmental wise? I mean, I know I hear about talk about the Ogallala Aquifer and these um, districts that are managing how much water you use. Is that a big push for the drip? It is. Yeah, it's becoming a bigger and bigger um, issue because guys are being limited on how much water they can use. So some areas restricted to nine inches of water a year. Well, the far, if you go far enough west, nine inches is not enough to use through a pivot or flood irrigation, and so you need to look for a more efficient avenue. So. I, I have all the, I'm thinking technical, I, I'm just thinking, uh, um, I'm always the equipment guy. So I'm thinking you got 60 inch tubes running through my entire field, patterned all the way across there. When I spray with my sprayer on my four-wheeler, my ATV at home, if I spray the wrong chemical and don't clean it out, it gunks up. 
I get, you know, and I, every so often I got to change the pump or change the nozzles or blow the nozzles out with my air compressor. This is all 12 inches underground. How in the world are we maintenancing this? I'm not to step forward now to where we're going, but I just think there's a huge, is there a huge maintenance issue to this or is that cost effective? Yeah, so there's, there's some learning and some proper procedures that you need to do. So for example, when we inject fertilizer, first of all, we're really diluted. So when we, when we do fertigate, there's a lot of water going with it. But at the end of every fertigation, we always run at least an hour of fresh water for that exact purpose. We don't shut the system down with fertilizer in the lines. We run an hour of fresh water at the end, which is all set up on a controller. So you guys so have figured it out. It, we, it, <laughs> okay. And it's all done automatically. Okay. Like you Very just set good. It, punch it in on your phone and it does it for you. So if I am interested, you know, just to start off with the beginning of, of the, the, uh, e the e what's the word I'm looking for, the economics of this. And I, I need to set up, what are things our listeners need to consider? We have to have a water source. Yep. How many gallons per minute per acre? Do you have a, a, a algorithm? Yep. So we like to see five gallon per minute per acre is optimal. That gives us an inch of water every four days. So that's, if we were to pick and choose, that, that's where we'd want to shoot for. Now we have systems that are, a lot of places in the country, you can't get that much water. So then we'll look, we'll go all the way down to two gallon per minute per acre, allows us to put out an inch every 10 days. That system has to be managed much more carefully because you have to start watering before you get dry. Right. You have to manage that soil reservoir, so to speak, and keep that soil full. So is that something where you move to zones? It is, yep. So we'll, in most drift systems have zones, but we'll have more zones if there's less water. Yep. Okay, and a lot of times too, we'll incorporate uh, soil moisture monitoring as part of the management of the system, so that any time that there's room in that profile, we'll try to pack pack moisture in. So how far away can my water be? So if I've got an eighty, mm. does it have to be a well on site or a river on site? How far can you pump water and yep. make it work? Yeah, pumping water is actually fairly inexpensive. We have a system at home that we're, we're pumping water three and a half miles. So we have a, a river at one end. We have several reservoirs along the way that we fill up during the off season. And yeah, three and a half, four miles, not a problem. Nice. Now, Corey, you're, you're, on your farm, you're uh, applying fertilizer on top, correct? Yeah. So every time you make a pass, it costs you diesel fuel, right? Right. So, uh, guys, is this... Is the cost saving come from getting the water on the right point, uh, or, or I'm going to say the cost benefit, or does the cost come from the added features that we can now fertilize through the same system? We have the infrastructure, I'll say. Yeah, I would say it's all the above. Um, so typically, a grower going from dry land to irrigation is going to get about, let's say we're adding, we typically say 80 to 100 bushel per year on a dry land to irrigated basis on drip irrigation. And, and usually we attribute half of that to the water and half of it, half of it to the fertigation. So that kind of, the, the ability to put that fertilizer in has given us an additional 40 to 50 bushel a year if a guy's paying attention and fertigating based on crop demand. That's some big numbers, Dave. That's yeah. 100 bushel? Wow. <laughs> More than the, it gained three bushels with this product. <laughs> <laughs> That's huh. correct. So is there a limit to what you can put in the lines agronomically? There are certain products that don't play well with bad quality water. So we won't use things like polyphosphates, like 1034-0. We don't use that. Um, anhydrous, we can't use that. Um, so there's certain products we can't use, but there's really no limit. There are some things we look at, like salt load and different um, agronomic um, benefits and and things that will and won't help the plant. That's one thing I learned out. Of, I went out to Kelly Garrett's um, this spring and sat with him for a day and just kind of talked. And uh, the quality of water, you know, the the metals in the water and all that that's tying up things. Are you guys looking into that or treating anything like that? We are, yeah. So the, the kind of the what we have identified as one of the hidden um, robbers of yield is bicarbonates, which is mm -hmm. an invisible substance that's in the water that ties up cations in your soil. So if you're irrigating, putting, putting water out there, most wells we work with or even surface water supplies have somewhere around two to 400 part per million bicarbonate. That is, so let's say a guy's got 200 part per million bicarbonate. 
and he is applying nine inches of water a year, he's tying up around 800 pounds per acre of a cation fertilizer. And those are, those are your potassium, calcium, um, so some really important nutrients, and you're tying them up with the irrigation water. So actually, there's a negative there. So how do we deal with that? So, yeah, like reverse osmosis, or do you put like a huge filter on this thing? No. It's a, it's a giant Brita filter. That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking, man. No, it's the magnet. <laughs> so um, acids, basically we have to lower the pH. We've got to bring the okay. pH down to about 5.5 to 6, and those bicarbonates will leave. They, they actually volatilize and leave. Um, so that's what Kelly Garrett's doing, for example. His plant food is an acid-based um, fertilizer. And so that removes the bicarbonate. One of the ways we learned this, so we have pivot irrigation and drip irrigation on our farm. And a few years ago, we had a, a corner that out yielded the center pivot by 29 bushel. Hmm. And this had been pivot irrigated for 30 years. And, were, and it was an ideal rainfall year. So irrigation didn't really add any value at all. And why would the corner out yield the pivot by 29 bushel? Yeah. And so we started doing testing and figuring out what was going on. It was the bicarbonate that had built up that had made the nutrients, the calcium, unavailable underneath that pivot. So is this something that if our, our listeners are applying and mixing on their own farm with a sprayer, that they could have the same issue because the water is of that quality also? That is 100% right. So okay. that's the reason all of these spray additives, AMS, that's what AMS yeah. does. It lowers that pH. Right. It gets rid of the bicarbonates. That's why there's a lot of spray additives that have come out. But arguably we're not putting enough AMS in for where we're at. So, guys, we're farm for profit. Um, so, I, I understand that we can make more bushels always, but everything comes at a cost. It's going to cost to put this infrastructure in our system. Um, not asking you how much it costs. What I'm asking is, do you have just a generic number as a rate of return? If if Corey puts this in and get yeah, 100 bushel per acre, how many years does it take to get the money back? to where he's now net zero and moving forward uh, would be the first question. And then if that's the case, is it a you know two and a half percent return on, on all of his acres or do you guys have a number to that? So payback period, um, typically, you know, if, if we look at, um, you know, commodity prices today, we're probably more in that like five to seven year range. Okay. If, if you look at, you know, where prices have been historically over, you know, 12 months ago, you know, we're probably more in that three to five range. So okay. um, it's, it is variable ba based on, upon uh, commodity prices. But um, we also ha have a, a financing program that, um, that you can run this through. And, and it doesn't require you to, uh, to tie up your land as part of the, of the program. So, um, and, it, and it can go for a term up to seven years. So, okay. so really what we've seen um, throughout putting systems in across the Midwest is that uh, generally if they run it through our financing program and they haven't seen the ROI, I mean, we're, we're probably doing something wrong. So, I mean, most, most guys I think have had a lot of success in utilizing the finance program to, to be able to, to get that extra additional yield and, and return on investment. Right. Yeah, it's almost like a immediate positive cash flow and then you have the depreciation benefit right it's yeah depreciable oh, we expense. love depreciation <laughs> we love depreciation <laughs> so i i had a, a funny comment and then dave sparked another question that i've had so if that loan goes bad how do you repossess underground lines right you don't go tear them back out of the ground so so our finance partner um files a ucc1 um, but but that's what what the uh, note is secured with is a UCC one. Okay. Yeah. So back to Dave's question about how much does this cost? I want to know, in comparison, especially Kurt, you said you have both pivot and drip because if this is the the cat's pajamas. Why aren't you all drip? You yeah. know, what's what's the cost comparison for flood, pivot, drip? Yeah. So a wide open quarter section, a center pivot is going to be less expensive. But if you've got a windshield wiper where that same center pivot's only covering half the acres, then we're going to be about the same price. So it, it depends on which oh, okay. the field layout makes a huge difference on cost on a center pivot, whereas drip is more per acre. How about the difference between like HEL land, highly erodible land versus uh, non-HEL land? So if, if we're um, west, I'm going to talk Iowa because that's where we're at. Uh, western Iowa, we have a lot more topography than we do in central Iowa where quarry farms. His is more square flat and black versus more topography. Do we get more benefit out of one or the other? Yeah, absolutely. So 
the 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 more cut up, the more highly erodible the drip is going to perform better there. Oh, really? And a lot okay. of those fields are are not they're not square anyway. Like there's all kinds of grassback terraces, for example, in there. So um, the the one of the challenges that we have with center pivots on our farm. We're in northeast Kansas where there's a lot of rolling terrain, terraces, waterways, is you can't get the water to infiltrate fast enough, especially out at the end of the center pivot. That pivot's going around and you're putting water on it, say, a, I mean, it'd be like a, a heavy thunderstorm at the end of that center pivot. Well, on highly erodible ground, that water can't soak in fast enough. It's very difficult to do that. They need to spread it out farther. So there's some challenges there on highly erodible ground for sure. I didn't think about that. You're also with a pivot, if you're going over terraces, you're watering the terrace to where your drip would not right. run through the terrace. You wouldn't right. be unnecessarily watering a square foot. That's why foot. it's efficient. Yep. What about, uh, what's the life of this? So we've got a system over here by York, Nebraska that we maintain that's 39 years old this year. Oh, still going. smokes, okay. So there's some old drip out there. So water quality, proper maintenance, 25 plus years. So is there a certain kind of pipe you guys have figured out that's in the ground? Is it polypropylene? Is it stainless steel? Like, I, I'm just trying to picture what the actual pipe looks like. Is it one inch, five inch? Like, I, I'm still trying to get a, a mental picture of what your pipe underground looks like. So the drip line is, um, the majority that we use uh, in, in this market is either a, a five-eighths inch okay. polyethylene tubing. So it's extruded and, and it's a, a 15 mil thickness or and I'm guessing you guys have tried different products and figured out what's best right. over over time. Yeah. So the 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 blend that we use to extrude with at NetFM is proprietary to, okay. to NetFM so and has been developed over you know the last 50 years. So, um, or I guess uh, 40 some years. But the um, uh, and then we also use a seven eighths inch. There's a little bit of one inch and inch and an eighth, but but mostly either 5 8 inch or, or 7 8 inch in, okay. in uh, diameter. So what's the, the process? You know, we got to say we got a water source and we got an 80 or a 160 and we want to do this. Is it mains you're running out? I mean, how do you putting this in? How does that work? So usually first we, we plow in the, uh, the drip line is, is kind of step it's one. It's just like, it looks like just a mini tile plow, right? Uh, essentially, yeah. And, and, um, and there's, you know, different different plows out there that are available um you know kurt they have several andros plows andros is our preferred or i'd say it's anyway my preferred uh, manufacturer of a plow they, they do a really nice job uh, uh building plows but they um so yeah it's kind of like a, a miniature tile plow it has you know a deep shank and it comes out the back and and um and then one so you know in some situations we might plow the tape in and then um, once the, uh, the drip line's plowed in, you can go in and plant if you're willing to s sacrifice a little bit on the end okay. in order to come back in and trench and put connections in. And, and then a lot of times the filter station is one of the last steps. Because you have more of like a PVC main that they're hooking into, yes. correct? Yes, yeah. So the, a, lot, a lot of times the, the, um, the mains and sub-mains are PVC. There are some projects where we're actually working with HDPE as okay. well. What is that? What's Wait, HD? What is yep. HDPE? So HDPE is a high density polyethylene um, tubing. So uh, I, I guess one one way to kind of think of it is if you look at um, a lot of the uh, conduit for fiber optic lines that you see on the sides of the roads, it's you know blue, orange, and yep. Um, that, Interduct. That, yeah, type stuff. that is a, a HDPE product. So uh, when I built my shop, I asked the people that were doing the heated floor, I'm uh, a do-it-yourselfer, I wanted to put it in. So can you guys give me the pattern and I'll, I'll put it all in myself because I'm going to pour the concrete and then can you bring the boiler after that? So now you got me wondering, can I put in my own drip line? Can will you supply the product or is it like you have to install it your, like you guys do? Or can, is that something that, I'm sure you have a pattern, you want them to do it to make sure it's done right, but a lot of guys are do-it-yourselfers and try to save where they can. Yeah, there's times that does work where the farmer's um, willing to do their own installation. We can train them. They can come on another job site and watch us. Oh, fair enough. Um, we actually rent our plows out, so if guys want to do their own install, we're open to that. I gotta say, after I got it on the on the berries, I mean, as long as you know how to, you know, glue PVC and dig a trench, and you got a drill, pretty and, simplistic. And I mean, it, it's not hard. Like, and so I compare to that to like I wouldn't know the first step to putting a pivot together, right? Right, or a gearbox, or dealing with that. 
It's really a simple system. I mean, it's all hydraulic. There's no moving parts in the field. There's no electricity in the field. Um, all the all the hydraulics and the power is at the well. Yep. Or the water supply, which can be surface water. That's something we haven't mentioned. So one other mechanical question. We, we had a long field. We're mile-long rows, let's say, whatever. Um, i, I got to assume that the holes in the beginning of the drip, uh, do they get more water than the middle? Or how do we keep constant pressure out of all those holes? Do we have to position the pipe right? Or is there is there a reason that it gets to the center with just as much volume and gallons per minute as it would at the end? Yeah. So we'll, every field gets its own design. So we run it through a CAD program that simulates all of that friction loss. It simulates all the elevation changes in the field. And then we're going to choose the right diameter for and the right emitter for how long a run we're doing. Okay, and there will enough. be some limitations on how far we can go. For example, we can't go a full mile without splitting it probably in the middle and, and adding new water in. So typically we're going half mile runs, maybe 3,000 feet. Um, so we can go a full quarter section from end to end. So at the fire department, when I worked there, we did relay pumping. We couldn't go more than you know a couple city blocks. So we were we'd relay pump and then we'd step up the pressure again and go farther. Is that something you do, or do you need a whole new water source? You were talking about three and a half miles away, you could push water. Um, you know, now we're less than a mile to push it through the neutral drip. So how do, how do we get that? How, if we have big fields and we want to throw this in a large, large field, how do we do that? Yeah. So actually, elevation has more of a play in adding booster pumps for example than than distance so distance we can we can overcome that with just bigger pipes um, but when we have elevation change that's when we need to add booster pumps but there are some cases where yes we would need to boost pressure nice so, well I, I want to go just one more on my scenario so Iowa we typically have in my area 20 to 30 gallon a minute pumps we don't have the thousands or, or wells I should say what how, how do you set that up in my yeah. situation so we're going to have to have more water. So usually in Iowa, a lot of places we're looking at surface water. We're looking at collecting tile water. Um, there's a lot of places where we're pulling out of some small streams or rivers. Um, you can get permitted for that. Can you put in your own cistern or, or you, lagoon style? That'd lagoon be pretty style. big, wouldn't it? Yeah. I was going to say that would be a big cistern. Yeah. So, so if we talk about surface water, and here's just kind of some rough numbers on size of that. So let's say we... Usually in, in Iowa, eastern Kansas, eastern Nebraska, we want to be able to apply six inches of water a year. So let's say we got 100 acres. We want to put six inches on that. That means we need 50 acre feet of water, which is a five acre pond, 10 foot deep for 100 okay. acres. That's still a pretty good sized pond. It is. And so I heard earlier um, that you said app. You said app. What if it rains? We get good rain in Iowa. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, I don't need your your drip right now because, man, it's been raining for the past 10 days. Does it default and know that, hey, don't apply anything today? We, we already got our six inches a year? Yeah. So we use soil moisture probes or different kinds of imagery to decide when to water and when to shut off. Um, right now, that's not an automated feature where it's turning it on. Okay, so I still There's have still to be... still a manual decision okay. in there. There is the ability to tie that in, but most growers still want to have that level of control where they're looking at forecasts, they're looking at growth stage of the plant, how much my water capacity is, and deciding when to turn on and when to turn off. But So NetFM's in the process of developing crop models that will take into account all of that information, and then it will send an email saying, like, a, you know, what your target, you know, target irrigation should be for the day or, or that there's, you know, no irrigation needed. That had to have been the loudest golf cart. <laughs> yeah. I just want to remind listeners, we are out at Husker Harvest Day, so yeah, well, you get the natural environment. As AI progresses, I bet just uh, studying the analytics and statistics of it, it's, it's going to maybe get easier for that app. But, uh, Corey, when I'm thinking of how much water a day, it, you have hogs too. Yep. So you have feed, uh, manure every day, et cetera, et cetera. Do you, do you have automation stuff on yours, or do you manually make the decision? For the feed? Yeah. No, uh, it, it, it's automated. Okay. It feeds the, the pigs when they need it. Manure-wise, it just goes into the pit, and then we haul it once a year, which is something I'm excited to talk to these guys about. Yeah. As the I, I want to learn more about Kurt's operation, and then we can jump into talking about that. So you said from Kansas. Hi Hiawatha? Hiawatha? Hiawatha. Okay. Let's, if you don't mind, describe for our listeners what your operation looks like. Is it a family farm? What's that set up like? It is, yep. Family farm. So there's five boys in the family. Um, two of them, two of my brother's farm. Um, two of us do drip irrigation. And then I have another brother that's a pivot dealer. So we have all forms of irrigation on our own farm. We're about 4,000 acres there. 
About 30% of it's irrigated, so mostly dry land. And what kind of crops? Uh, corn, soybeans, um, some specialty corn, a little bit of organic. Um, we're in the organic field a little bit. Got it. And uh, we learned last night, too, that you yourself, your lovely wife, and you have just a couple kids. We do. We have eight children. So It's a busy house. you got to have all that labor to put the drip in, right? That's right. <laughs> Building our own workforce. <laughs> No, that, that's really cool. So how did you start into the irrigation business? Is this something your family has always had before you, or when did you take off into being a, a rep? Yeah, so back in the fall of 2012, we, I guess a couple things I didn't mention. We have a landscape business, and we have a garden center. And in those greenhouses, we actually used to raise hydroponic tomatoes. So my dad's an entrepreneur, has done different things. So fall of 2012, bad drought. We had a had a quarter section that a center pivot covered about 100 acres of it. And there was a ditch ran through it. There was 40 acres that the pivot couldn't hit. So we thought, you know what, we've got to find a way to irrigate this. We had the water supply for it. So we looked at drip, put the drip in on our own field first. And in the landscape business, we were looking for a way to expand and kind of diversify. And 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 when we put that in, it was kind of an aha moment for me because when we raised hydroponic tomatoes, Every week we would take a tissue sample and then we would adjust the nutrients going through the water based on what that tissue sample said. And you could manipulate the flavor, you could manipulate the texture, um, the size of the tomato, you could manipulate everything based on what you did with the nutrients. So it was, we had been doing you know, some nutrients through our pivot, but it was kind of an aha moment but that now I have that level of control over my whole field that every single day I can water it and fertigate it based on that tissue. The pivot's going around every four or five, six days. And so you can't touch that plant near as often as you can with a drip irrigation system. So that's kind of how we got into it. Um, and then it, it's really just really taken off over the last five, six years. So we've seen you guys down at uh, Commodity Classic in Orlando. We saw you at uh, the World Pork Expo in Des Moines. I mean, Nutri-Drip, you said you just cover this area, or like the corn country, but you're all over the place. I mean, when I think of Nutri-Drip, I think of Netafim. I don't think of the other way around. Like, you've branded yourself well. You, you sell a lot of places, right? Yeah, so we're, we have systems from North Dakota to Oklahoma, um, out into Ohio and Kentucky. So we're kind of covering the whole corn belt and kind of serving that market. So is there a, who, who covers the specialty crops out in California and Arizona then? Different, different? Yeah, there's a, there's a whole other host of dealers okay. um, out west. And, and actually, I would say that the, the dealer penetration is, uh, is much more advanced. It's a much more mature market out there. Okay. Um, you know, it's hard to throw a rock without hitting a dealer out really? there versus, you know, we have, um, ha it's, it's been a, a wonderful thing for NetFM to be able to have Kurt as a partner and Kurt and his team as, a, as partners because, um, you know, they have a sales rep in Minnesota, sales rep in Southern Missouri. So, I mean, they, they have definitely dedicated the resources to, uh, to be able to penetrate the, a, a large footprint. Okay, so now we can get into the manure side because when, when Jim Ed introduced himself, you said that was your role. You were dealing with crap. Yes, it is. <laughs> so expand on that. So about nine years ago, uh, one of our customers in California came to us and, and they were experiencing um, some major drought conditions and they said, you know, hey, what if we could repurpose this wastewater or manure water out of our dairies? And, and be able to, to either put that out or mix it with fresh water and, um, and put it through drip. So um, one of our employees, Dennis Hannaford, who has since retired, has spent probably the better part of five years almost every day helping this customer develop, um, develop a way to, for us to do this as, uh, as partners. And, and so... Um, that has, solution has now been commercial for about a year, between a year and a half and two years um, on the West Coast. And, um, and during that development process, I kept talking to Dennis and I said, you know, hey, I think really where this true opportunity for this is, is, is in swine in Iowa because, you know, we, we apply all this manure with dragline. We put it all out at once. Um, you know, we're putting our nitrogen at risk. Or even worse than drag line, um, tanks and, yeah. Yeah, or tankers. Mm -hmm. And and so um, so I kept hounding him and hounding him, and, and then we finally got the West Coast Dairy Solution commercialized. And, and um, I, you know, every time that I have to give a presentation for a business plan, I, I present this as part of my business plan. And so finally, 
the guy who's now my boss said, well, you know, you're so passionate about this and, and um, think it's a go. Well, well, here you are, you know, you, you, you got your worst wish. <laughs> so, um, so we're in the process of, of kind of refining um, five more solutions. Um, for so we call it SDI-E. So it's subsurface drip irrigation effluent for the E. And um, so we have the West Coast Dairy solution, and, and as I mentioned, it's commercial. And then we're pretty much ready to go commercial with a Midwest Dairy solution and um, a Mid Atlantic Swine solution. So Mid Atlantic Swine is mainly about about eighty percent of those houses have uh, have lagoons instead of uh, pits like mm -hmm. we do in the Midwest. So um, then the, the next step is, um, and we're getting really close to having the um, pit solution developed for swine. And then we here in the last couple months, we've actually had some of the larger um, uh, vegetable processors that use a lot of wash water mm -hmm. and um, to come to us and say, you know, hey, what if we were able to utilize all this, um, you know, material that we have out in lagoons on irrigation versus having to treat it before we can put it back into a stream or, or wherever they're going to release that water? So they, there's a lot more stringent requirements on how they have to treat that water versus if they had adjacent crop ground, mm -hmm. which, um, for instance, like Grim, we've been in conversation with Grimoy Carrots and um, and they're you know very close to to looking at, at doing this and and then also we uh, have a, a a relatively small uh, beef packing plant that they run about actually they they pack they uh, kill uh, beef emus and ostriches <laughs> in, in, in this packing plant in alabama and they, and they run about 65 head of cattle a, a day through it and uh, so they've got five acres that they're going to going to put their affluent water out on. So, so the industrial solutions is is kind of that last so forefront. You, if I'm understanding this right, you're using all the water. So Corey, like your hog manure, we're gonna we're gonna extract the the water out of this. We're gonna reuse it. Uh, arguably, there's probably some manure benefit in the water as well that's going on the field. What happens to the solids? So the solids are collected, and then you can dry spread those um, across fields. And and one of the really nice things about being able to have those solids available versus putting everything out as a liquid is there are some fields that are getting really loaded up on P. And so we can spread it out a little farther. Now you can haul it. Transportation. Yeah, haul it a further distance without having as much cost and freight. That's why I was most excited about it for our hog barns, Dave, because we haul a lot of our manure anywhere from two to six miles with, with tanker trucks. And the further we go, the more expensive it gets, and we're hauling a lot of water. If I could get that nutrient dry and haul it on trucks, I could take it 20 miles away. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's huge. You could take it to that new farm 51 miles 51 away. 51 miles. <laughs> it needs it. It needs it. So, I mean, I, lo I love that. How, how are you separating the solids? So it really depends on the application. So... Um, so there's different processes with different um, ways that we're doing it. And so in, um, for instance, with the, the swine pits, we, we come out and go through a screw press. Mm -hmm. So from the pit to through a screw press, and that's where it creates a lot of that dry material and, and um, gets rid of the hair as right. well. That hair is in the dry. Yep. And then um, from the screw press, we have um, the uh, microfilter, actually we have a series of two microfilters that we, we've been testing that uh, further separate it and then from that then it goes yep. into our NetFM commercial filtration. Yeah. So and is this something that's out there like, I, I, I can, a lot of our listeners have livestock on the side and if they, I say on the side or maybe a part of their main, can they go look at one? Like, do you have something somewhere that's in operation that Corey can go check out? Yeah, they need to do it on my farm, and you can come look at it there. <laughs> well, then, okay, so Corey's going to be the test farm. We got it. All right, fair enough. So, so our, our main site on swine is in northwest Iowa. So, yes, we have a site set up there, okay. and then west central Minnesota on dairy. Yep. And, and have they proven that uh, – have you proven a, 
even larger rate of return. So now we have three things. We have manure uh, management. We have uh, uh, possibly more uh, accurately placed manure. We have more water, uh, most efficient way to get water to the crop. And then we also have fertilizer to it. So is their rate of return exponentially uh, exacerbated? It is because they're lowering they're lowering that cost of hauling or applying. So now we're doing all that application during the season. And, and now the next piece that we get into is right now you put out what? Five to 6,000 gallon an acre of hog manure, right? You do it one time a year. 4,000 on our farm, but okay. Yep. So, so the question is then how low could we go with that number? How many more acres could you cover with that manure and replace commercial fertilizer? Right. Which would be huge because, you know, we get over 300 to 350 acres, which is about, you know, a quarter of what we're doing. Like if we could get over 75 or 100 percent, oh man, last year would have saved a lot of money. A lot of money. So there's still nutrients then in the water. Absolutely. It, yeah, our, our pilot dairy, uh, initial pilot dairy that's our partner, they for the last um, four and a half years have not applied any synthetic fertilizer and have grown their yields by an average of 25 to 30 percent. Wow. Wow. <laughs> what kind of nutrients in the water would we be looking at a, in a hog site, do you think? So all of the nitrogen and potassium and micros stay in the, in the liquid. Okay. And then there's about 30 to 40% of the phosphorus that's in that dry. So okay. there's still actually quite a bit of phosphorus in the liquid, but 30 to 40% of it's in the dry. Okay. So do you have to be an agronomist on your farm if you're just uh, uh, If you're just like Dave. If you're just like me, I was going to say Joe Blow farmer like me. If, if you're that, I, I don't know the uh, agronomy side of it. Do you guys partner with them to study that and what that looks like? I mean, Corey's going to know everything, yep. but I might not. So do you have resources for that? We do. So Nutri-Drip actually has two in-house agronomy um, on staff now that help we help growers not just on the manure side but also on just drip irrigation and what to do with nutrients through the drip so we're actually stepping into that role not displacing the on-farm scouting and on-farm agronomists but just yep. how do you use the drip system to deliver nutrients at the right time how does the dnr see this it's re relatively new right are they still making you have a manure management plan and all that kind of stuff so you still do need a manure management plan because you are applying the manure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but so even for the water. Oh no, no, for the for just water. Um, so that's no, just considered a fertilizer that, at that point. That's irrigation and and fertilizer. Yeah. Okay. Well, that changes things a little bit. It gives you a little advantage. Kurt had a pretty uh, interesting statistic last night, and I don't think it's probably going to a blanket statement. But you guys said you did what, like a hundred some thousand gallons, and you ha only had so many solids. Yeah, so we, on a, the swine uh, barn there in northwest Iowa, we pumped 110,000 gallon, and we had about three cubic yards of solids. So there really was not a lot of solids um, that came out of it. Now, I will say we did not agitate the barn. Yeah. We had the pump sitting about a foot off the bottom, and we were just pumping. We did not agitate. So That's there, still amazing. There was not a lot. So, Corey, if you pump this out more often, could you have a shallower pit? I, yeah, I would think so. You could save a lot of money in concrete. I was going to say, could you save money in concrete if this became very mainstream? Or I'm sure they would probably, you could just do a shallow pit and pump it out to a lagoon, and then it'd probably be easier to handle because it's more watered down. It would be. <laughs> yeah. I see. So the old style, you know, old Murphy barns with the yeah. lagoons would probably come back in style. That's right. Less, it'd be potentially less cost if you already had the lagoon in place or had uh, the the financial resources and space to put that in place, you're saving all your concrete costs on a new barn also. So there's a lot of future tech that this could really push the direction of. Yep. And one of the other things we've uh, been working with in the last year is a pit agitation system for deep pit barns where we're actually putting a drip line on the floor of the, of the hog barn. It was a new barn, thankfully. Um, but we, <laughs> we anchored a little 5 eighths drip line to the floor of the barn, and then every minute... 10 times a day, we're bubbling air in the manure. Ah. So that, that manure looks completely different than a typical hog barn. The, the, the ammonia levels in the barn have gone from about 15 part per million down to four part per million. And what we think is gonna happen, or what we've been told, is that the nitrogen value in that manure is gonna go up because right now it's volatilizing as ammonia. And, and the fact that we're keeping that in agitation, we're actually gonna have higher nitrogen values, less solids, a much easier product to work with. Well, I imagine with. you're changing the microbes, you know, to an aerobic environment and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's interesting. So it, if you had less ammonia in the air, would it be 
more longevity on your facility too, Corey? I would think. They're less acidic. 100%. And less H2S as well, correct? No H2S. Yeah. So pretty much we've eliminated H2S. Okay. Because we're constantly agitating, and that doesn't have a chance to build up. Really? I kind of want him to come and put that in our existing part. No, yeah. yeah. We're you gotta, working on Get that. the waiters out. <laughs> get the waiters <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, how about uh, utilities? You said you pushed water three, three miles, and then we're looking at this manure thing. Potentially could be pushing miles. How do you go about you know going across other landowners or ditches and roads and that kind of stuff yeah so you have to have easements um, we have had a few growers get easements from the county to go in the road ditch um, we at home on that three and a half acre system our three and a half mile system we actually work with some neighboring farmers and we we all pull water out of that okay. and we have different reservoirs that we put that water into so, so it's almost like a utility it really. is yeah yep. hmm. is there any way I guess we've kind of covered that, but I was thinking so many guys in Iowa have tile, and they're pulling the tile off the fields, or pulling the water off the fields um, to store that. I know some guys have made reverse tile where they're trying to push it back on the fields, kind of like a neutrogyp system. Um, I guess you'd have to have a levee. You'd probably have to keep that water, like you're saying, just a really large cistern to reuse that. Right. We have a system out in Illinois at the PTI farm where they built a reservoir, collect 100% of the water through tile, and that is 100% of their irrigation water. Is really? What, what okay. So it has been done. It has been done. Complete circular system. There's no water leaves that farm unless it's a really big rain event. They're catching 100% of it, using it as irrigation, and they've been between 40 and 110 bushel um, advantage on corn and about 29 bushel on soybeans over the past four years. Wow. That's the ultimate recycling system. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it because that yeah. When you think big, big picture ag, and you think about all the pressure we get for greenhouse gas emissions, I mean, this is something that can contribute to reducing the footprint. Correct. So, um, so what we've seen in uh, we we did a test in California in partnership with Sustainable Conservation. They're a, a non governmental organization that we partnered with in, in commercializing out there and um, UC Davis found that there was about a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emission by the um, application of the manure through drip versus uh, flooding it out over the field. So is there a carbon benefit here? I mean, I know carbon's I, kind of a buzzword, but you're you're kind of sounding I, like you I, could push for it. I, I think that, that there may be something there. Uh, we, we've got to try to figure out, you know, who to, uh, who to work with going forward and, and investigating that further. Hey, we don't have an outline. So this has been a 100% organic conversation up to this point. But now we know that we don't know it all. Now it's the fake conversation. So what did what? no? <laughs> we're we're going to let them take over because I know we missed something. I, I was going to say just like uh, uh, interstates. Interstates were for inter intercontinental uh, travel, and and then it became people could travel, people could do other stuff. Uh, what what's the next thing we can use the infrastructure of your drip system for? What else can we push down it? Mm, interesting question. So we're doing some work um, with carbon dioxide. Okay. Right now, um, bubbling carbon dioxide into water and impacting the level in the field. There's some research work being done on that. We're also doing some work injecting oxygen, like actually bringing an oxygen tank to the field, running it through a nano bubble machine, and raising the oxygen level at the root zone. So one of the things the plant has to have in order to take those nutrients in is it has to have oxygen. And so can we impact the oxygen level 12 inches in the soil think what that's going to do to biology, um, nutrient uptake, all of the things that it's going to impact um, down underneath. So that's kind of opposite of how I normally think because plants use CO2 and put out oxygen, but you need the oxygen in the soil. We need the oxygen in the soil. We need the CO2 at the leaf level. Right. We need that in the canopy. But this, what we're seeing is the, the CO2 was injected through the drip and it migrated up through the soil and it elevated the level of CO2 in the canopy um, about... 50, 50 to 60 percent higher than ambient air CO2. So now huh. you need to tap into one of the CO2 pipelines and have a second drip at two inches from the surface, <laughs> or, and and that one's just pumping CO2. The other one's pumping oxygen. I was thinking nutrients. just like full circle. We get yeah. the carbon credit, and yeah. then instead of our own pipeline, we have our own pipeline. We just put it back into the soil ourselves, and we get more carbon credit. Hmm. 
That's interesting. It, and we're we're also working with the nano bubbles in in um, in Israel as well. Our agronomy team there is so. Wow. Nice. I want to go back to a comment that you made that I wrote down because I don't know what it is. You said that you've got veggie growers that are asking if they can utilize your product for their wash water. Yes. Why Why is their wash water have to be treated before going back into uh, a water source? Because sometimes they add other products to it, other chemicals. that. Um, so it has to meet EPA's clean water standard in order to be released. Because it's not like they're just washing the dirt off the vegetable. There's something else that, like you said, a chemical or a treatment right. that could still be on that. Yeah, guys are killing pathogens. You know, they want to treat it to kill pathogens as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, because I was imagining the wash water that I have after pulling carrots out of my garden, and I just flush it down the sink. I guess I got one more mechanical question. I'm just thinking of this getting plugged. And so as it gets plugged, I like sensors. So when I think of pipelines, they have uh, digital flow meters all throughout this. Does this have any kind of sensors, you know, okay, 100 foot out, I know it's working, but 400 feet out, something's wrong. So eventually good maintenance is, is good product longevity. Do we have something that, that monitors for maintenance? We do, yep. So every system has a flow meter on it and pressure transducers that are constantly measuring what the flow and the pressure um, in the system is. Okay, and so good. what we do is we graph that over time. And so if that flow, let's say we're supposed to be running 500 gallon a minute at 30 pounds of pressure, and over time that pressure starts to drop and the or excuse me, the flow starts to drop and the pressure increases. We know we've got some kind of plugging going on. Um, what we would do in that scenario is dig up some drip line, figure out what's in there. Usually the remedy is acid. Um, we'll acidize the system and that will eat out whatever is starting to plug that up. So, so continuing on tech, we're sitting here at Sukup. I can run my dryer from my phone now. Can I run my drip irrigation system from my phone? You sure can, yeah. Lots of technology out there to be able to remotely start, monitor, write programs, fertigate, everything you want to do yep. um, from the comfort of your office. That's or awesome. Pickup. Oh, nice. So, or Puerto Rico. Or, yeah. <laughs> on a beach somewhere. The lake house. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like a win-win. There's got to be some headaches, some issues somewhere. What's the, is there any downfalls? So the two maintenance things that, that get brought up and that need to get brought up, um, number one is rodents. So uh, oh, rodents yeah. like to chew on it, right? And so we have to manage that issue. Um, it can be a problem. The biggest issues are ground squirrels, pocket gophers. So they need to be scouted for. If they're out there, they need to be eradicated somehow. How many cats per acre is Corey, that? We uh, heard a story. <laughs> we heard a story about electrifying water. Could we just electrify the, the, new, <laughs> the line? And the well, there you go. <laughs> no, it's too far below the ground. <laughs> no, that, so rodents are one issue. The other one we have to really watch out for is water that has high iron or manganese. Um, those two minerals can plug the drip line up. We can treat for it. We can filter for it. Um, but we've got to pay a lot of attention to that water quality. It's really important. See, I was trying to guess what your next, you know, you set that up as a two-part thing to worry about. And I wrote down tree roots. Tree roots we have not had an issue with. Um, the, and I guess one, one reference I would make to roots, though, root intrusion can be an issue. Um, if specifically on perennial crops like alfalfa, if you're deficit irrigating. In other words, if you're not irrigating enough and those roots are looking for water, they will look into the emitter and crawl in there. So what we do is inject some treflan. Um, so you can inject some mm -hmm. things in the water that will basically create this little zone around the emitter where the roots won't penetrate. Hmm. Interesting. That's good. So if I'm looking to get set up, what's the, what's the best route to, to take? Call Kurt with a K. Well, right. I don't have his number. I don't, I mean, do I go to your website? Yeah, yeah. website. Everything's on the website, NutriDrip.com. Um, we have a YouTube channel with lots of educational material. Um, lots well, of stuff to learn there. What time of year do we start? Because arguably a phone call is not going to get you at my farm tomorrow. So there's got to be a planning stage. There's got to be an engineering phase. Then there's a need the equipment stage. Then there's a product stage. Then there's a testing stage. What's start to finish? Four months? Um, as short or as long as you want to make it. Um, I would say on average it's a year from start to finish. Longer, um, okay. Yeah. So, but we do projects. If guys got their water supply already lined up, we can be done in a couple months. Well, I think you, I think you put one in like two and a half weeks uh, here a couple of years ago. That was pretty stressful. Yeah, it, 
it, <laughs> water supply is really the biggest challenge. Getting the water, getting the water figured out. So that's Tanner, could we 179 deduct this? Well, he said depreciation. Um, I would believe that it could qualify I just as 179. Well, you know, like buildings are uh, f uh, over a certain, they're depreciable assets at a different rate. I'm not an accountant, but I got to wonder if this isn't that uh, 179-able. If we have a really good year, we could uh, tag into it. Yeah. So, so it's a very similar uh, depreciation as what you would do with your tile. Okay, very yeah. good. And, and another um, financial benefit that we haven't talked about is moving your ground from dry land to irrigated mm -hmm. um, increases the value of that land. It's going to say how so, much does it when so we then, sell it. So when you sell it, not a, but not only when you sell it, but when you um, are sitting down to do your balance sheet, you're going to look a lot better with that increased value. That's interesting. There you go, Dave. There's been a lot of great put them in. Been a lot of great pieces in this conversation today, and we appreciate that. Corey, I'm going to have you think of a challenge for our listeners, but I uh, really want to say thank you for sitting down. And I, I wrote more notes than I was expecting to, knowing that we've had this conversation multiple times, but I continued to learn. So we're, we're looking at subsurface drip irrigation, and uh, we're 12 to 16 inches deep in most cases, and we're either on 40 or 60 inch centers as we put these systems in, try to pump water up to a half a mile without adding a new, introducing new water to run a longer run than that. <clears throat> we can do small patches, but we can do entire quarters, depending upon the gallons per minute and water access that we have. We're able to inject nutrients. Uh, we're also able to uh, set this on zones. So if you have different soil types or whichever it is, uh, we can utilize uh, various ways to go about that. Typically looking somewhere between five and seven years to get a return on your investment. There is financing available. Uh, we can leave this, if properly man maintained, for well over 25 years lifespan for the product itself. And we've got economic and agronomic benefits and maybe even helping Corey with his manure management plan as we look at another way to add value to the livestock side of an operation. So. Those are just a couple of things that I wrote down. appreciate you guys sharing with us. Corey, what would you challenge the listener? I would say just open your mind. I think that this uh, brings irrigation to places that it's never been before, um, fertigation to places it's never been before. Go to NutriDrip.com, check it out. I think that it adds a third thing to our list of things that are no-brainers, tile, grain bins, and subsurface drip. So uh, one thing to add real quick, Corey, yeah. is uh, if they're looking at wanting to look at information specifically on the on the internet for Netafem, yep. it, make sure to go to netafemusa.com. Netafemusa. And not netafem.com. Okay. Because netafem.com offers some products that we sell globally that are not offered in the U.S., so make sure to go to netafemusa.com. Okay. That's you guys good. have like agronomy type stuff on there? Yes. Okay, yep. good. Yeah. And are you guys on uh, social profiles? A lot of our listeners are. Can they find you anywhere if they want to ask you a question or slip into your DMs? Is that the way I say that? <laughs> slide. Oh, slide, not slip. <laughs> a slide Whoops. into the DMs. Twitter. Uh, Jim Ed Beach 365 for Twitter. Yeah, NutriDrip is NutriDrip's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Nice. Very good. Great. Well, thanks again for hanging out with us, listeners. And until next time, have a good one. <laughs>